look at that as if by magic, the uh, the music disappears on us. That's brilliant. Um, uh, kia ora koutou, uh, ko Stuart Diamond, toko ingoa, ka au, uh, kai tohu tohu mā tāmo, o he pōwarangi. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Stuart Diamond. I'm the Chief Advisor at the Climate Change Commission. We're very happy to see you all here today. Uh, double thanks for coming out on a wet Christchurch day uh, to come and uh, hear from some wonderful panellists that we have um, lined up for you, uh, put on by Climate Change Commission and also the University of Canterbury, uh, talk about climate action. Uh, we've timed the event today so that it coincides with the Commission's consultation phase on our draft advice to government on the direction of the next emissions reduction plan. And just short advertorial, that consultation phase runs from the 26th of April through to the 20th of June. So lots of time for um, all of you to put your submissions in uh, on the draft advice and let us know what you think about it or any other thoughts you have about the climate action that um, we would want to advise government on, particularly for that period 2026 to 2030. Um, so today we're going to find out more about the Commission's draft advice on the second emissions reduction plan, which is now up for consultation. And we're also going to hear some different perspectives on what's needed for Aotearoa New Zealand to meet its 2050 emissions <laughs> reduction target and beyond. We've got four wonderful panelists joining us. Uh, first, uh, from uh, this end, uh, Here Pawarangi Climate Change Commission Chair, Dr. Rod Carr. Thank you, Rod. Uh, we have um, next to him, uh, University of Canterbury Professor Dave Frame. Uh, then we have Associate Professor David Everson, also from University of Canterbury. And finally, at the far end, and not least, uh, Dr. Barry Anderson, who is the General Manager of Sector Analysis at the Climate Change Commission. So after the panelists have introduced themselves and they've provided some opening remarks, we're going to throw the floor open for questions. You get to ask them anything you like about climate change and the pathways, et cetera, 2050, what we're doing now. But first, some housekeeping announcements. Um, Emergency exits uh, are pretty straightforward. So there's some large glass doors with green signs above them with people running. Uh, head out from one of those if you need to. If there's an earthquake, uh, please drop cover hold. And then when it's safe to move, uh, we're to go out through the door to my left, your right, uh, and meet out in the front there by the car park. Um, the Whare Paku, the toilet is out in that direction. So there's a few of them actually, not, not just one. If you go past that way with a big colorful um, stairway is you'll find uh, bathrooms over there. So uh, opening slides, Lara, there we go. Um, so um, let's have a look, it's very far up there. Uh, we, I'm not gonna go over all of that. We consulted on our draft advice to government on the uh, session, second emissions reduction plan, which runs 2026 to 2030. Um, and it's important, as I said at the beginning, for our advice to reflect what people of Aotearoa New Zealand think about climate action, think about the, the draft advice, and great to have all of you here today. And as I said again, um, please do put in your, uh, your comments and, and through that consultation phase. Um, and I've given you the dates and they're up there on the screen for you, running from the 26th of April to the 20th of June. Next slide, please, Lara. Oh, back up to that one. Thank you very much. So this slide, I'm not gonna go through all of the details, but as a little bit of background, and Rod, I may be stealing some of your thunder, um, the Climate Change Commission is an independent crown entity. Um, it's not the government. It doesn't make decisions about, um, about climate change uh, policy and settings, but it provides advice independent from government, uh, and the government then takes that advice and decides uh, what to do with it. Um, so we have a whole bunch of things that we are legislated in the Climate Change Response Act to do through the two functions of providing advice and monitoring. Uh, this is one of the important pieces of work. It's the second time we've provided advice to government on an emissions reduction plan with Anaya Tonune being the first of those uh, that came out a couple of years ago. This is the second time around and there's some resonance between the advice we provided there and the advice that we, are, uh, we have a draft out for now. Um, whole bunch of other things that we do around specific aspects of the pathways forward what we might include in that pathway and the targets or the gases we might include. And also importantly, next year we'll produce our first monitoring report, which is the second part of our functions where we'll be um, providing an analysis and judgment about uh, how is the government going in terms of its um, progress towards uh, the emissions reduction plan and commentary and review around adaptation also. So with that um, introduction, I'm gonna pass straight across to Barry. Uh, talk us through the draft advice, please, Barry. 
Laura, can you just go to the next one? First one. So just following up on what Stuart said, um, you know, as as he mentioned, uh, the last time the commission did work like this, uh, it was for the 2021 deliverable at Nia Tonane. Um, when that advice was given, it was a lot bigger than this, and that's because it was uh, advice on emissions budgets one, two, and three, so out to 2035, as well as emissions reduction plan one advice, so that first period of 2022 to 30, as well as uh, some other deliverables that the minister asked uh, the commission for advice on. So it was a boatload of things all stapled together. Um, this advice is just one of those kinds of things. It's just strategic, uh, or it's just direction or advice on the direction of policy for the 2026 to 2030 period. So it's a relatively simple exercise if you think about all the work that was done on the first round. Um, if you can just go to the next one. And uh, the luxury of the second go around is that uh, the government has accepted uh, the advice of the commission with a few uh, minor adjust adjustments, but generally speaking now budgets one, two, and three are in place. So the government has said roughly, these are the net stair steps that they're uh, trying to have the country going on on its pathway to the targets uh, in the act. And um, this is a, the slickest way that I could find to illustrate roughly what does the government expect to achieve or what must be achieved through policy actions for each of the budget periods by sectors. So I guess there's about a thousand words um, that's coming out of these pictures, but I think the big takeaway is that uh, emissions reductions in the transport sector are increasingly important for achievement and uh, energy and industry. Um, have a pretty big role to play as well. It's probably sooner and later. So with all that being said, uh, the goal or uh, the work that we've done to try to put out this draft advice for consultation is um, if you look at just the sheer accounting of the opportunities and the risks to achievement, where do you point your efforts and where, where does the government really need to look at um, where the risks are and the opportunities to get into where they need to get. Um, we boiled it down to 19 um, recommendations uh, that cover you know, pretty much the entire economy, as well as some recommendations that are enabling um, to allow the system and society to go on a desirable pathway to achieving those targets, not just uh, some socially undesirable least cost outcome. And I think there's three bundles of the recommendations that are relevant <clears throat> for the discussion today. So I'm just going to say them really quickly or put them up on there and you guys can have a quick read. Um, and hopefully it will help you take a note and say, I should go read these chapters in the, in the draft mm -hmm. advice. The first one's the obvious one. And um, right now in emissions reduction plan one that the government has put out, they have specified sector sub-targets, which are levels of emissions for given sectors that they think are likely to happen if everything goes real slick. Um, and our response to that has been, uh, those should be firmed up and should be used for the basis of policy setting and for driving towards rather than just something to watch for and they may come out. And I guess the whole point is that uh, if you're going to design policy well, you need to be designing it for a certain outcome and not just kind of hope you get somewhere and maybe it's okay. So there's no magic to the numbers of 362 and um, 322. Those are the numbers that uh, are the gross emissions levels in the current emissions reduction plan. Um, so this recommendation is just saying, uh, let's use those for some, for some policy direction and that. <clears throat> and it's the same thing on the forestry side. Yep, that's okay. And then uh, the flip side of that coin, uh, this is chapter 10, I think. Uh, and it's the, you know, emissions budgets are not gross. You'll probably hear gross and net loads today. Gross is shorthand for emissions to air. Generally speaking, net is shorthand for emissions to air, less sequestration. Um, and so budgets are net. So the question is, what of gross, what of removals? And uh, this recommendation is just focusing in on the fact that um, there's multiple benefits of forest and forestry, and uh, 
we would probably all be better off here if a thoughtful and reasonable approach was taken to deciding what the goals of forests were. And forests is a very big umbrella term. So pardon the shorthand right now, you know, indigenous uh, fast growing exotics, you know, uh, fast growing exotics may be reverting to native. The answer is yes, not or. And the final one is once you kind of get your head around those two things, um, what are our goals for gross and net? What are our goals for forests? Uh, then the last thing you come to is what's the biggest, baddest tool in the, in the climate policy toolkit that the government operates right now that can either help achieve these outcomes or increase the risk of pear-shaped outcomes. And that's the NZETS uh, in, in its current incarnation. So yeah, you wanna just go there. And so the, the uh, if you followed along this far, this part shouldn't be surprising. And that is um, make sure that your tool is tuned according to your strategy. So the important thing is, uh, of course, if you have a look through chapter four of the advice, you'll realize that um, there is a risk of long-term and durable incentives for forestry to be part of the net zero solution for the country. And that's why um, the second part of this is said plainly as such, uh, you know, forest, as we'll hear, um, foresters and forestry operations have long planning cycles and uh, all this stuff is important for people to do the right thing tomorrow for the right things to happen in the future. I think that's it for me, yeah. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks very much, Barry. Um, so, and just to remind people that this is a snapshot of some parts of the draft advice, there's all sorts of other um, uh, interesting proposals that are in there. And we've kind of cherry picked out a few of them uh, to put on the slides today, including to reflect our esteemed uh, panel, which I'm now going to turn to David, who's going to speak standing up. Wonderful. Uh, maybe you can introduce yourself and your role here. And uh, over to you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, kia ora, David Everson um, from the School of Forestry here at University of Canterbury. Um, I'm going to stand up because I'm used to having far more control over the slides than I've got today. And I have to look up there and and um, direct proceedings. So you could have the first slide, please. Um, uh, um, the, the way I'm approaching this is to look at some of the advice that's already come out and the, the IPCC came out with some fairly stark advice last year, which was that we must act now and we must take dramatic action. And they also said the problem is now sufficiently serious and urgent that we must use all the tools at our disposal. Thirdly, we can't um, get to where we need to be by just reducing emissions. We need to remove carbon from the atmosphere and we must get to net zero by 2050. So um, that's sort of behind um, everything I say as I'm, I'm tending to believe this advice. Uh, next slide, please. And the, um, the Climate Change Commission uh, said in their draft advice that they needed to, um, that the role of forests in managing emissions needs to be addressed and with urgency, and I thought um, I can help with that. So um, that's what I'll talk about. Uh, next slide, please. So um, in summary, there's, there's probably four ways that forests should be used. Um, in mitigation, forests should be an accelerator. So if you've got a plan to reduce gross emissions um, by a certain amount, then planting new forests can get you to that target sooner. So, um, so forestry, forests should be primarily used to offset gross emissions that are temporary in the sense that we have a plan to remove them. So that's the first thing. And secondly, I think it's, it's also the way um, this problem seems to work is that there's, there's some relatively easy emissions to, to, to remove and then they get progressively harder and there's, you get to the point where there's some emissions that nobody has any clue how to remove. And so we should also anticipate that genuinely hard to remove emissions may need to be offset by planting new forests as well. So that's the, um, oh, that's the end of the mitigation story. But on ad ad adaption or adaptation, um, I, I believe that, that um, uh, forestry can help here in terms of changing land use from agriculture to commercial forestry. Uh, if we do that on a certain proportion of the right sort of farms, 
will, will help New Zealand economy um, and will provide products that can provide substitutes for concrete and steel and construction, plastics and packaging, and fossil fuels and energy. So new product development will also provide other opportunities. So that's really the, the four points that I'd like to make. So I think, uh, next slide, please. Uh, the, um, I'd like to compliment the Commission on its, its emphasis on gross emissions. I think that's absolutely where we need to be spending most of our attention. Um, some work's been done on this, some early work done on this, um, suggested that, um, that in terms of gross emissions reductions by 2050, um, the most optimistic scenario was that we could perhaps halve our emissions. So uh, doing the best we can, and all the things we can do, we could we could halve our emissions. And this is total um, total CO2 equivalents. So starting at about 80 million, we could probably get down to 40 by 2050 in the next part. So, and I think the some earlier work by the Climate Change Commission also indicated that the trend would lead us to, to being able to get rid of um, half of our gross emissions by 2050 which is good, but we've undertaken to get to zero by 2050. So clearly we need to do something else. And so the next slide will describe that. So um, what I'm gonna show here is, is an assumed gross emissions reduction. And if we just click once, so that takes us from 80 to 40-ish by 2050. Then I'm gonna assume with the next click that we can somehow get to zero um, gross emissions by 2080. I have no idea how we'd do that, but this is just for, as an example. So we've, we've admitted to be at, at net emission zero by 2050. So the next click shows what that would look like. And then we should probably want to stay at, at um, net zero to, till 2080. And so um, what I'm suggesting, if you click that one as well, yeah. Yeah, so, so the, the vertical difference between the green and the blue line is the sequestration that would be required by trees. And it's temporary because, at least in this simple world, we've got a plan to get rid of all those gross emissions by 2080. So what would that look like? Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so, so effectively what we're saying is that net emissions, we end up with that amount of net emissions um, under the net emissions path We'd, we'd, we'd still be emitting one, two, three, four billion tons. Um, but by se sequestration, we would save for the next click, we would save that much. So effectively, you're halving the emissions that would go to the environment. So the benefit of this using forestry as an accelerator is you, you have the amount of greenhouse gases in the environment. So that should be worth something. Next slide, please. So um, that's the, the green represents the this required sequestration and um, the yellow represents a model of, of, um, of what you could sequester by planting some trees. Next slide. And that's a planting program, total of 1.75 million hectares. So that's doubling the size of our current commercial forest estate. Um, it says about 60,000 hectares in 2022. I think that's about where we're at. So what that's saying is with a planting program of that size, um, if we had that gross emissions reduction, we could get to net zero by 2050 and, um, and stay there till 2080. So um, the benefit, uh, so we, could, we can comply with our, uh, the urgent, urgent recommendations of the IPCC, and we can also meet our international obligations. The path you take is important and so by uh, using sequestration, you emit half, half of the, um, uh, um, your emissions end up in the atmosphere um, as, as if you just use gross emissions reductions. Okay, um, now I'm aware that my scenario is not all that realistic because I don't think we're gonna get to gross zero, um, but then the remaining emissions you'd need to, any emissions that you couldn't uh, get rid of, you'd have to offset with further planting. And I've got a scenario that shows that as well. Okay, so in a simple example, we've doubled the size of our, size of our planted forest estate, and it could easily dub, double its contribution to the New Zealand economy and diversify our economy. And so that's, to me, is the uh, significant role that new forests could play in climate change mitigation and adaptation. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David. And we'll be opportunity for people to dig into forestry, uh, net gross emissions, uh, and other sources and the questions. Thanks. But I'm going to pass over to Dave Frame. Dave, introduce yourself and looking forward to what you have to say. Thanks. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, I'm Dave Frame. I'm um, professor of uh, physics here at the University of Canterbury. Um, I'm also in the School of um, Earth and Environment. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay, so um, next slide. Uh, I, I, I could talk a little bit about what David was just talking about. Um, using CO2 equivalents is uh, ambiguous over your warming results. There's a whole bunch of devil in the details about what temperature scenarios uh, that would lead to, um, depending on um, which of the gases you abated and which of the gases you kept. Um, I won't go into that because it's very fiddly. Um, it's actually conceptually quite simple, but it's quite fiddly. But some terms and conditions apply is all I'd say. I, I don't disagree with the general thrust, but we also haven't undertaken to get to net zero CO2 equivalent gases by 2050. That, that is, you can, you can stop warming without pushing methane all the way to zero, and the IPCC is very clear about that, because it's a short-lived gas. So um, it, you ask me if you want to know more. Um, so really the point I want to make is about the strategic side of, um, of climate change strategy. So this is a, a book I really enjoyed, John Lewis Gaddis, who's a Cold War historian, writing um, a, basically a set of lectures he gives at Yale uh, on grand strategy. And he defines grand strategy as the alignment of potentially unlimited aspirations with necessarily limited capabilities. And so you have your capabilities on one hand, your aspirations on the other, you have decisions and a bunch of behaviors that try and map, try and align those two things so, so that you achieve what you want. In the case of climate change, I think, so I did these slides, I had a 12 o'clock deadline, I was doing them at 11.50, can you push the button? Yes, okay, so climate mitigation potential is that are our capabilities, and that's, at the simplest level, that's natural resources, labor, and capital. Um, and then I've bundled policies, technologies, and behaviors in my way of, meet, of mapping those capabilities uh, through to um, your climate targets, so, so to what you're trying to achieve, your aspirations. Um, and the challenge, I think, for New Zealand, as things currently stand, next slide, is that if you um, seek ends beyond your means, then sooner or later you have to scale back your ends to fit your means. There's a gap that I think everybody recognizes, uh, cool, thank you, between um, our aspirations to limit, to do what we can to limit warming to one and a half degrees and our ability to deliver on that. Uh, and and um, I think that gap will only grow. At some point, and in fact, uh, it was handily up on the slide before, revising targets is part of what we're going to do. Um, I think there's, I think we can be more subtle while leaving ambitious targets on the table. Um, we can be less of a hostage to fortune than we are currently are. Next slide. So the reason I'm bothering with this is because we aren't going to stay under one and a half degrees. Now, this is a thing that you're not supposed to say out loud, but everybody knows. Um, that is the world history of, um, of CO2 pathways in terms of just this is emissions of CO2. And that's the main greenhouse gas. And actually, it's pretty much everything else washes out. Aerosol cooling, short-lived stuff, nature-based, blah, blah. This is what you have to get to zero. Um, uh, that dip in the last year is COVID. Okay? That was a 6% global drop in 2020 of CO2 emissions globally. That is by far the largest drop we've ever seen. It has since rebounded fully. Okay, next uh, push, yep. That is the, th those are the set, the suite of emissions pathways consistent with one and a half degrees. They imply a 9% per annum compounding annual emissions reduction of CO2 for 30 years, obviously with no rebound. We're going to, to stay under one and a half degrees. We have to have COVID and a half levels of emissions reductions every year, compounding with zero rebound for 30 years. And that's the world. Okay, next slide. Uh, okay, yep, tap it. Yep, 
So the world champs, as they never cease to remind us, uh, uh, emissions reduction of the UK, which has averaged about a 3% per annum uh, decrease since 1990, uh, with, a, with an annual average income of around 50,000 US dollars. Next, the world needs to average three times that with a world uh, an annual income of $18,000. Next slide, next one. So the world, yeah, it has to go three times as fast as the world champs with three times less money. So it's like saying to Usain Bolt, you have to run the 100 meters in three and a half seconds and you have to tow this lorry. Um, next. Yeah, okay, next. Yeah, next. When you ask scientists, this, is, this was a survey. So we got this little survey. As IPCC lead authors, you get these surveys from time to time. We were asked, how much warming do you think will actually occur from pre-industrial times till now? Uh, most of us, I put two and a half. So I'm actually, compared to my peers, I'm an optimist. Um, because I think I'm pessimistic in the short term. We generally uh, um, overestimate the rate of technological change in the near term and underestimate in the long term. That's a fairly consistent finding. Most people think three degrees. Um, so this is pretty widely understood, I think, by most climate scientists. Next slide. Next yeah, I, yeah, 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 story. So, uh, so I haven't, I've met a lot of people who think I shouldn't point this out, but it does need confronting. And it's why um, I think we'll need to talk more about the one and a half target. Paris doesn't commit us to one and a half. It commits us to staying under two degrees with ambitions with um, to do as much as we can to get to one and a half degrees. It's a band. It's not a single number. We shouldn't let people have the opportunity to say, oh, well, that's it, too late just because we exceed one and a half degrees, right? Every, the, the way most physical scientists put it is every kilogram counts of, of CO2. Uh, next one, yep, oh, yep, yep. So I think in terms of what we say in our legislation, which very strongly hangs off the one and a half target, is that if they had rewritten it, or if some, when, they, when, when they get around to revising this, and they will, um, by saying we will comply with article two, which is the temperature target, one and a half to two degrees, uh, providing others do the same, or in in you can find a better phrase for that. Most of you could think of a better way of putting that. Um, you know, uh, in harmony with other countries, if you like that sort of thing, we will go on the same journey as other countries. Um, and the reason I say that, next slide. Oh yeah, uh, next slide, because that's why we end up awarding ourselves. If we go on the track we're on, we end up awarding ourselves negative carbon budgets in sometime in the next ten years. No government is going to sign up to negative carbon budgets, but the international community is not going to let us off the hook. They wouldn't, if we said, oh, actually our rules mean we've got a negative carbon budget, you wouldn't get a lot of sympathy from places like Myanmar and Mali, right? So it would be a bit of a reputational disaster to keep this as it is. Uh, next slide, I can take questions on that. Yeah. Uh, Doing things around targets. This is next push, push the button. Yep. Tom Schelling wrote a very good paper, parts of which are obsolete, but most of which is um, really relevant. That just focusing on these distant targets um, isn't really a very good idea. And he was focusing on the 10% cuts from 1990 levels by 2000 in the Kyoto Protocol. And Tom Schelling, for those of you who, who don't know him, is a, a father of modern game theory and strategic reasoning. He's a voice worth listening to on this. Um, and he said, don't do it targets first. A serious proposal would specify policies uh, and do it that way round. Next slide. Uh, so if no one thinks we're going to stay under one and a half degrees, keep going. Yep. Then why are we creating mitigation costs with it that align with this target? Keep going. Um, and, and what we I think we should be doing is um, looking to benchmark our performance against best in class in each of the sectors. So rather than, so the Europeans successfully framed this as being about emissions reduction on some baseline level because they had very high emissions. And about two thirds, according to Adrian Macy, about two thirds of European emissions reduction predate um, the, e, the EU ETS. They are not the result of policy, they're the result of um, Margaret Thatcher closing the coal mines, the reunification of Germany, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the retirement of a whole bunch of old, really polluting Soviet capital. Um, what we should aim to, and we didn't have that, we've got these wonderful hydro power stations, and we actually had low emissions of CO2 that have gone up because of our vehicle fleet uh, population increase and so on. Um, I totally agree with where the commission of trying to focus things. 
Um, but, uh, but what we really ought to be doing, I think, is benchmarking each sector against best in class and trying to imitate, imitate them rather than have these more abstract targets that lead to slightly perverse outcomes and potentially reputational costs that we don't want. Next slide. Our actual progress fundamentally um, the world's progress is is contingent and almost entirely on what you do with geological carbon. That's what really matters. If mitigation are made at, um, among our trade partners is faster than we expect, then we ought to be able to buy low carbon products at, at uh, um, lower cost earlier. And that, that's great. That's where contingent action can suck you forward if you're trying to be best in class. Uh, equally, if you're if if they're slower than you think, uh, and I very much hope they're not, but then you wouldn't be creating a burden that you can't actually, you don't have the means to meet this point about capabilities. We don't make cars, right? So we buy cars secondhand off the Japanese when they've already driven them into the ground as far as they're concerned. So we will lag them. So, so I think we absolutely ought to be working on technologies, but there are things that aren't in our control about how quickly those vehicles come online. We can do all we can to pull them through charging networks, um, lanes for electric vehicles, other incentives to, to bring them through. I've, I've written on that with um, Arif who's Hassan, um, in, in case any of you are interested. Next slide. Um, so the problem, the, the, really, the really bad outcome is that we have these potentially large uh, um, commitment to buy international mitigation, so pay for forests overseas um, that don't actually reduce a kilogram of CO2 here. Uh, and in my way of thinking, that's a really not a good use of the money um, because it's not actually reducing, you're masking the symptoms rather than addressing the cause. And also once those numbers get up, and these are not my numbers, these are the climate commissions and treasury sort of numbers around about 20 billion over 10 years. That's about as much as we spend on the entire justice system. Um, push the button. Yep, go, go, go. So it's gonna be politically unsustainable. That's the main point. No, nobody who cares about the median voter is going to find that payment a more attractive payment than some combination, depending on preference, of tax cuts or reinvestment in New Zealand or infrastructure spending or health budgets or stuff that benefits New Zealanders locally. And so what we have to do is design, I think, a suite of policies that mix with targets that match, that do a better job of bridging this capabilities and um, aspirations thing um, in a way that will be politically sustainable for the median voter. The difficulty for the Climate Commission is that they report to a minister, and not to parliament as a whole. And this, these kinds of issues can be um, masked because of that reporting arrangement. Um, so that's why I think we don't talk about this anywhere near enough. Okay, that'll do. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, and for opening up a, a rich conversation and a great example of how when you reach into climate policy, it doesn't uh, take very long before you hit a, a whole lot of complexity and a, hey, a whole lot of people who have great opinions about um, about different ways to tackle it. And we'll look forward to more conversation about that later. Rod, uh, you get the final word uh, if, as the panelist and then Q&A, of course, but over to you. Thank you all for coming out on a wet Friday afternoon. Um, I would like to pick up a couple of themes. First of all, Dave and David, thank you very much for turning up today and uh, and talking to us about things that matter. This, this is a big agenda. That's the first thing. So let me tick off a couple of things that are really important. Um, Dave Frame has quite rightly said that targets matter. Um, and the commission is put in the position why by the end of next year, 2024, we are required under the Act as it currently stands, and Parliament can change, uh, to provide advice to the government of the day on the targets. The Act as it stands says we must provide advice on the targets, but the Act also specifies the criteria that must be met before we could recommend a change in targets. So absent a change in the legislation that was passed by 119 members of Parliament, by the way, Act did not vote against it. David Seymour was absent from the House that day. Uh, so 119 members of Parliament put that piece of legislation in place knowing that a review of targets would be appropriate, 
but that to change the target, certain things had to have happened, and they're prescribed in the legislation. But irrespective of whether those criteria are met, we are also to provide advice on whether or not emissions associated with international aviation and shipping should be included in our domestic emissions budgets. So from that point of view, we will look forward to having that conversation, Dave, about what are useful targets informed by the Act as it currently stands or as it might be amended in the future. The role of the Commission is to provide advice. We don't set the targets and we provide advice but don't set the emissions budgets, which have been set currently out to 2035. And we don't actually write the emissions reduction plan. We provide advice on the plan and the government of the day then adopts a plan. And the plans are for a sub period. So the first plan only covers the period out to 31 December, 2025. And the draft advice on the direction of policy that we're out there with now covers the emissions period from the 1st of January, 2026 till the 31st of December, 2030. And it's advice on the direction of policy. So that's all of the kind of mitigation kind of stuff. We also have to, by the middle of the year, say whether or not the government is on track to achieve its plan and emission budgets for the first budget period, the one we're in at the moment that is largely all but done, to be honest. And you won't have to be too clever to believe that this will be a failing grade, but we'll wait and see because the evidence is not there yet to reach a conclusion. We need to get the data that informs the evidence that underpins the advice. Then when it comes to adaptation, the role of the commission is to look at the national adaptation plan and report on the progress towards achieving that plan and whether or not if we achieve the plan that would be effective in adapting to the changing climate. Because the one thing we all agree on is that we have already baked in temperature rises which are incompatible with the way we live. So why is two degrees such a fixation in both the UN IPCC work and the public dialogue around, whoa, stop, two degrees or more is really tough. My understanding is the geological record says that for the last 300 million years, as far as we can tell, planetary average surface temperatures have oscillated between minus four degrees centigrade and plus two degrees centigrade around the levels that we estimate to have existed between 1850 and 1900. So we ain't been there for a long, long time. And never since we, as this kind of species, occupied the planet and did agriculture the way we do it. And there is little evidence in the geological record of a sustained rapid increase in carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere as Dave's graph foretold. Some of that is evidence, right? but it's also best estimates. There are times when there has been up to 10 times as much carbon dioxide in the air as there is today, not while we've been around. So the challenge for adaptation is there's an increasing argument we can't afford mitigation because we've got to spend all the available resources on adaptation. And there's two reasons why it has to be an and, the mitigate and adapt. And the answer for that is if you think adapting to two degrees is tough, try adapting to three degrees. The costs compound, the losses become extraordinary, and the social dissolution that occurs under that strain is enormous. So we need to do both. The mitigation of emissions is by the middle of the century, lifestyles that involve high emitting activities are gonna become relatively less desirable and less affordable. And those whose livelihoods depend on high emitting products and services are going to be more vulnerable to disruption through alternative technologies, changing consumer preferences, and for those who trade transborder, foreign regulatory interventions. So all of that says is actually in New Zealand's own self-interest to deal with reducing our emissions. Dave is also right when he says the game in town is the combustion of fossil fuels in the open air. 
80% of this game globally is about that. If we don't fix that, it doesn't really matter how many trees we plant or how we conduct ruminant pastoral agriculture. So you've got to be on that journey. Gross emissions reduction from the combustion of fossil fuels in the open air. And already those countries that moved a little sooner than we did, the UK, Sweden, California, are selling the world the low emitting technologies. And while it is true that we won't manufacture battery electric cars, it is also true that New Zealand, like Norway, is such a small consumer of these products relative to global supply, that if we create the enabling environment sooner, we can take up as a proportion of all our vehicles faster than larger economies can for our own self-interest and co-benefits. The Ministry of Health has estimated that three and a half thousand New Zealanders a year die either directly or indirectly from the degradation of their lungs as a result of inhaling fossil fuels burnt by combustion engines. Like that's nothing about China or India or the United States. That is us breathing our own crap. We have voted ourselves per capita one of the largest, cheapest, and highest polluting motor vehicle fleets in the OECD. That was a choice to be cheap and dirty. So we could undo that choice if we wanted to, have better cars, lower emitting cars, and fewer cars. So mitigation matters. Gross emissions count a lot. And forests are a good thing. However, forestry in the emissions trading scheme is called out by the Climate Change Commission as problematic and potentially means the emissions trading scheme will fail by the middle of next decade to deliver any type of financial reward for those taking up lower emitting technologies. Why? Because there is a risk that we will create so many forestry credits by the middle of next decade and that technology and changing consumer preferences will have reduced gross emissions to the point where both forestry will discover it as being disappointed in its expectations of rewards, and more importantly, that taking up new technologies will no longer be rewarded by cost savings. So from New Zealand's point of view, we need a well-performing emissions trading scheme that creates obligations on emitters that can be met in part by their gross emissions reduction, rewarding them for the lower cost of emissions, and in part by taking up investment opportunities and undertaking new and better business practices. But the emissions trading scheme alone will not be enough to do it. Complementary policies, clear guidance from government about phase out and ban by dates will be critical. Germany has banned the installation of new pipe work for fossil fuel connections in Germany, even in the face of an energy crisis. New York City has banned new fossil fuel pipe connections to the network. We seem reluctant to make a similar choice here. So from New Zealand's point of view, we do have choices. We choose not to do some things. It was interesting talking to some European colleagues at one point. They observed that it is entirely New Zealand's sovereign right to choose not to have nuclear power, to choose not to dam its flowing rivers, to choose not to genetically engineer its food crops for feed for animals to reduce emissions. It is entirely within New Zealand's sovereign right to choose to buy cheap high emitting motor vehicles from the rest of the world as they dump them on us. But it is not New Zealand's right not to make its contribution to the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from all sources, however measured. So that's the challenge that we will face as more and more consumers and voters and regulators realize that no one gets a get out of jail free card. But more importantly, that there are very real opportunities for those who develop low emitting lifestyles and design and develop the lower emitting products and services 
that the planet will have to take up by the middle of this century. The work of the Climate Change Commission is advisory. We set no prices, make no regulations, hand out no grants, but we don't report to the minister. Our advice is prepared and presented, yes, to the minister, who is required to table it unedited in parliament within 20 days, or we, under the Act, must release it to the public. Current minister has never made an attempt to influence the work of the commission or predetermine its outcome. But parliament and the Climate Change Response Act has specified the mandate of the commission and the deliverables that it is responsible for. But to Dave's point exactly, unless we can find a political coherence for sustained action over decades to come, then the flipping and flopping of public policy is simply going to cause households to hold back and businesses to delay, defer, or not undertake the necessary investment. It is in all New Zealanders' interests to find a political consensus around an urgent, achievable pathway that we can and should all choose to support whatever the flavor of the government of the day. Kia ora. Now we do Q and O. Thank you very much. Uh, and well, before we go to Q&A, a little round of applause, please, for our panellists. Thank you. Well, that's a rich smorgasbord. Um, and the Q&A, the wonderful thing about Q&A is you can ask whatever questions you like about pretty much anything, because we've covered pretty much <laughs> amongst them everything. Draft advice we've got on the table, the role of forestry, long-lived, short-lived gases, do targets matter and what should they be? The political economy, the choices we make as households or businesses, um, the floor is yours. Uh, so um, welcome questions. If you can just pop your hand up, if you have one, uh, if you're not a student, uh, uh, please, if you can just introduce uh, who you are and where you're from, uh, that'd be helpful. And I have a question, Lara, uh, just in the middle aisle. Thanks for being the first question. As I was sitting uh, listening, I kept thinking to myself, critical events, critical events. We've had some in localized places, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. And I wonder when is the first critical event that's going to be so on a massive scale that the world is all affected at the same time? Maybe that's not in science, but that's my fear. And then I wonder, well, what effect does that have on policy and advice and political will? And I wonder what that event might be. And so I just wondered, you know, what would an event take to galvanize? Um, I'm from Christchurch, and we watched an earthquake create a lot of galvanizing effect for the for the public and a lot of things that weren't considered achievable became achievable so it's kind of in that in that way of thinking that i'm wondering your thoughts super question uh what's it going to take um to galvanize us to take the action that we need um i see <laughs> rod are you going to go first no, go, dave. dave uh this is one one for you sure. okay um so uh it, things like global mean temperature don't don't actually affect people directly. Um, whether or not it's one and a half degrees or 1.38, people don't really care about that. It's a proxy for the damages that occur for those things. And those damages are localized. They may be very widespread, but they're localized. If everyone has a fire, then you know it's their fire locally, um, but it's but it's wide, but the experience is widely shared. Um, some people think that that um, that events um, shift politics, and I think there are ways in which that's absolutely right. Um, personally, I think that the 
kinds of things that are happening um, that Australia has seen will probably lead to tensions between people who work the land and people who dig underneath it to pull coal out of the ground, who've generally been in political harmony with each other and their interests will diverge. So it can shape the politics at a national level. Um, in general, though, cranking up the climate sensitivity dial intensifies the incentives. So um, uh, an analogy I use is, imagine we go out to, oh, into, is that Bentley? Is that what it's still called? The foundry or something? Yeah, yeah the foundry. So we all go in there and we order some food and, and drinks and um, the bill, we anticipate the bill being of a certain amount. And we, we turn up at different times and eat different amounts. We earn different quantities of money and so on. So our circumstances are different. We have to have this live real-time bill splitting conversation. It's the political economy side. How do we divvy up the responsibility for it? Now, if you if it turns out that they, they see that it's like a former vice chancellor and they decide to price gouge and they multiply all the numbers by 10, do you think those conversations about burden sharing will be made simpler? So, so the political economy side doesn't necessarily, if the problem's just more acute, it doesn't, and you have to do more faster and put more money down, doesn't necessarily simplify the politics of the problem. Um, I think it's I think it's a subtle it's a it's a more subtle thing. We are not all in it together uh, in our experience of life on Earth. Uh, now I mean that as a descriptive statement rather than a normative one. Uh, and and that's sort of the issue that if 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 we were if there was you know China's eighteen percent of the world population and and so they internalize a lot of the problem when they choose to do something they can make a material difference. But but we don't generally share uh, those things, so I don't think they'll galvanise in that way. I think we did have an experiment. I think Dave, you referred to it, the global pandemic that affected everybody everywhere. Hundreds of thousands of people died, and it wasn't a climate-related event. Absolutely nowhere was it a climate-related event. And the response globally had this kind of unintended consequence of showing us that if you grounded all the world's airlines and sent everybody home, we are so dependent on the combustion of fossil fuels in the open air for industry and business and emissions from agriculture to feed ourselves that global gross emissions fell 6%. And that just goes to the nature of the problem that we have spent one and a half centuries really getting a lot of use with a very significant byproduct from fossil fuels. And we aren't necessarily going to find a novelty that will solve all of that universally. And I think that's the challenge that every ton is a ton, whether it comes from me or you or India or China, the planet sees a ton of emissions. If we reduce our emissions by a ton, set aside the argument about leakage, if we reduce our emissions by a ton, the planet is better off by a ton. Now, if we reduce our emissions by a ton and somebody else increases this as a result of our action by one and a half tons, the planet is worse off. But if we reduce our emissions by a ton and somebody else increases their emissions by only half a ton, planet is still better off so that's why this argument about leakage and how this intersects with other nations behavior is very challenging so don't know david have you all the trees start dying would that wake us up well yeah i mean i think we've depended since the start of our existence of, on on the presence of trees so if the problem is trees not being around any longer then climate change will pale into insignificance. You're passing on political economy, Barry. How very diplomatic. <laughs> okay, great. Um, thanks. Yes, please. Um, yes, please. In the middle aisle at the back. Thanks, Lara. Yep. Is it working now? The... Is it working? Yes, yeah, it is. Super. It is. Thank right. you. Kia ora. Uh, my name is Eric Kennedy. I'm a climate change activist and a poet, and I co-edited a book of climate change poetry from Aotearoa that Rod Carr wrote an epilogue. Um, my question is, um, so in these, this conversation, we've heard a lot about how industry and investors have to make money on reduced emissions. And for my money, not enough about the imperative to reduce emissions, whether it's profitable or not. Um, so the future seems to be coupled with growth. 
will the Climate Change Commission be outlining any scenario involving degrowth? Well, that's a great question. Um, Rod's picking up the microphone. Yep. Rod, over to you. Uh, the, the answer is probably not. Right? And, and part of the reason is that degrowth is a broad church that encompasses a lot of different views about the world. Um, there are many, and probably you included, who are more versed in that actual architecture of a degrowth argument. But the idea that in our democracies, and it's particularly interesting watching the latest budget, that in our democracies, voters would deliberately elect for less income, the way we measure it, even if it meant they were better off, is some decades away from being the norm. That unfortunately, we have designed an economy where we tax activity and hand the money back. And the hand the money back is how we as electors choose to elect those who govern us. And until that connection decays sufficiently, I don't think that you can make a mainstream argument that says we're all better off if we have less income. Thanks, Rod. Uh, and Barry's going to chip in with some thoughts from the end there. Yeah, I think the other thing worth um, thinking about in, in just to tag on to the Rod's opening statements, in all the work that we do, anytime the, the commission picks up its pencils, um, we have to uh, think about the matters of 5M in the act. It's written on, a, on the back of all of our eyelids. And it's basically the way that parliament told the commission to say, anytime that you'd give us any advice, it has to be thoughtful according to these things. And it's uh, intergenerational welfare, um, te tiriti, uh, uh, regional and social economic impacts, ecological co-benefits, you know, all the things you would think would be a holistic way of doing work. One of those is economic impacts. And so to the extent to which any of our advice or analysis in the future would result in uh, significant and adverse growth or degrowth implications for the country or sectors or anything like that, um, we have to make that part of our evidence and advice. Uh, and so while it wouldn't be, while degrowth is not a North Star to align the advice to, as Rod said, because that's not our job, our job is to advise on getting to targets. Um, the implicate, if degrowth falls out of some of that advice, then it will be spoken to in the work and won't be buried or anything like that. So it's um, it's one of the building blocks of, of the good work that we must do. And if we don't cover off things like that, then uh, you know politicians should hand the work back across the table and say, you didn't do this properly. Uh, thanks very much. Any other panelists want to talk about address that? No, I've got a question in the front though. Thanks very much. Kia ora koutou. Um, Sarah Templeton um, from Christchurch City Council. Hi Rod. Um, so a couple of things fall out of this and actually um, following on from the, the previous question. What we've seen is a lot of technical um, with some commentary around what might be possible in the political and Rod's clear that um, he doesn't, people around the table don't seem to think that people as a whole will change their behaviours unless there's something in it for them and they won't vote that way. What we know is actually that people will do that if they're given the right circumstances. So whenever there's a major disaster, for example, people actually rally around and they're good to each other. People are at heart kind and not selfish. So what work is being done if we want to get to our emissions reductions targets, um, keep growth possible at 2.5 or 3 degrees, for example, um, which is not going to be possible? Um, what is being done to change the people side of it, to give the politicians the mandate to be able to implement the policies that we know we need, rather than just saying politicians won't do it because they don't have the mandate? Great question. Um, Dave's, yeah, please, over to you. I've probably been working on this problem for longer than most folks. And um, people do shift. And so the median voter shifts. Uh, I used to get in taxis 20 years ago and tell people what I did. And, uh, you know, they'd give me a very long um, screed about how it was all nonsense and all this stuff. And that just doesn't happen anymore. And that flipped 
when because people are both kind and selfish when um all the cabbies moved to driving camrys electric camrys and um and uh what's the other one the prius yeah the prius that's the one and all of a sudden they were burnishing their their green credentials and if you make people follow the incentives and if you if, if the incentives are strong and if um, you give them the incentive, if they have incentives to do the right thing, they'll do the right thing. And if they can do the, if they can bear a small cost um, or a large cost for a short time or a small cost for a long time, they'll do it if they think it's right. But they're unlikely to bear a large cost for a large time for a long time if they don't see other people doing so as well. So um, people do shift; they do change. Um, there's a lot of ways in which we've seen social change in, in our lifetime. Um, but sometimes the models we use for social change and climate change aren't re don't really map very well to the problem. The question is really like, what are we doing to incentivize change rather than necessarily to put marketing or people to change? Like, what are we doing in the We've got a lot of experts around the table. We don't have a good solution for those things. Um, yeah. So, is an element of this which is beyond the mandate of the Commission? I mean, one of the elements is public education. How do you help people make sense of this stuff? Because it is technical, it is complicated. With the best of intentions, people can find that doing things with unintended consequences. The Commission is not mandated or funded for public education. So the closest we get to it is when we're out for public consultation, we actually get the opportunity to run around and try and explain and tell people, and in that context, try and give people a better understanding that may enable them to better engage and support with our elected leaders. But, but there is no budget for behaviour analysis. There is no budget for public education. And maybe there should be, and maybe it should or shouldn't be with the Commission. We certainly, in our draft advice, and particularly when we did Anaya Tornune, were pitching for things like, I mean, we'll call it a citizens' assembly, creating standing fora that could help a diverse group of New Zealanders better wrangle with this technical stuff. Um, the government to date has chosen not to pursue those kind of initiatives. Thanks, Rod. Barry, uh, you wanted to add something on that, please? Yeah, I, I think, um, so in, in the first chapter of, of our draft advice, we have a very simple policy kind of framework that we kind of say, this is how we look at the world. And it's, you know, pricing emissions or making sure there's incentives for good behavior, um, removing barriers and addressing things that, you know, mitigate opportunities. And I think a lot of that's the human factor. And then also try to do smart things so you can be ready for the future. Simple stuff, right? Um, the commission is uh, technology agnostic. We don't say this widget, that widget, you know, this windmill here, that windmill here. Almost all of the recommendations I was just looking through, as you said it, are really about helping humans get out of their own way, make sure planning systems work so renewable generation can be built, uh, make sure there's good support services in the ag communities to make sure that, you know, extension can help uh, good behaviors get adopted across 23,000 farm gates. A lot of it is like that um, because we have a really uh, comprehensive approach to emissions pricing with the NZETS, you know, despite its warts. And in theory, on January 1, 2025, we're going to have an ag emissions pricing system that will be imperfect, but will be a basis for improvement. There's really nice architecture. And so I, I'd be interested for you to be look through the, the recommendations and the advice and, and see. Uh, I think a lot of it really resonates with the point that you're raising about helping uh, both humans and institutions get out of the way of being, you know, world-class adoption kind of machines that Rod says we need to do with uh, all kinds of stuff. Great. Uh, David or Dave, uh, anything to add on that one? No? Um, there's going to be some other questions. And perfect. Yes, there is over there. Thanks very much, Lara. Um, microphone on this way. Um, my name is Brittany. I'm a master's student at UC. My question is less political in nature, and it's about the transition to electric cars and more hybrid vehicles. 
So Ms. Anjani Hay proposed we do this. There's cost benefits aside, we've got further urban sprawl here than other cities. So Christchurch keeps moving more and more out into the Selwyn district. So how do we mitigate this issue when it's not a walkable city and we don't have large numbers of people taking public transport? So I'm interested in the things you think could help this transition quicken. Thanks very much. Uh, Rod. So there is, one, there is one specific recommendation, Mary suppose you've got his finger on the exact wording of it, which, which the commission is pretty clear that there are lower emissions in, the more you build up than out. It's just a simple statement of urban design and the carbon footprint per capita, as well as in total of a densification of urban. And we're not talking about 30 story high buildings, we're just talking about more is better. And the densification helps with public transport networks, frequency, reliability. Um, yes, it's nice if the government wants to help make the per passenger cost lower, but quite frankly, if the buses don't turn up reliably, it doesn't matter how cheap it is, people will not rely on them to get to places on time. So you need both. You need affordable transport, but you also need reliable transport, and then you need a density of population. So the Commission is very mindful of our built urban environments by the middle of the century need to be denser. And in addition, we need to decarbonize ground transportation and particularly the light vehicle fleet and lowering emissions, both of the in-country fleet, tailpipe emissions from what we have, as well as the new to country fleet is going to be critical. And if we don't figure out how to decarbonize transport, both through mode shift, as well as decarbonizing the in-country fleet, then we are never going to make our contribution to global emissions reduction and the world will notice. Christchurch is- Dave, yeah, it's you. Yeah, thanks. Christchurch doesn't have the geographical constraints that Auckland and Wellington have. And I think that means the temptation to sprawl and create more congestion is, is quite acute. I'd love to see a rapid transit network running running down through Christchurch and, and down as far, you know, sort of a regional one. Um, uh, and then try and get um, multimodal public transport, um, walking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've seen park and ride work. Um, I lived in Oxford for 10 years. It was it, it was great. A lot of people used it. It's I think it's um, improved since as well. Uh, one, at, once things become normal, they get normalised. Um, and uh, I think there's lots of things we can do. I wouldn't hang my hat on one particular solution. Um, I think one of the problems we have when people do engage communities is quite often we talk to the same section of the community over and over again, and we don't, you know, the, the, the um, young climate activists are good at coming up with solutions that work for young, able-bodied people. Um, and they, and it, it, that's where the citizens' assembly and the diversity of, of the population needs to be a factor. Um, but I think that Christchurch needs to have a pretty firm way, or, or maybe not Christchurch, of preventing further sprawl, because congestion's a big deal. It, 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 you know, it's a bad thing anyway. Yeah. And I think that's a really important point to remember is that even if we decarbonize ground transportation, the emergence of autonomous vehicles is going to make congestion even worse. <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't fix the congestion problem by low emitting vehicles. Yeah. You have to fix the congestion problem with other interventions. So that would be one thing. The, the second thing I mean is just, just remember the demonstration path that the Commission used to inform our first three emissions budgets out to 2035. Half the motor vehicles on New Zealand roads in 2035 are still going to be internal combustion engine cars. And sometimes we don't do ourselves a service by allowing the debate to polarise and allow some people to say, well, I can't fill in the gap. Take a bus because, take a bike because, walk because. And you go, yeah, well, we're only expecting, you know, half of the motor vehicle fleet to be swapped out in the next 15 years. So half of them are still going to be the farmers driving their internal combustion engine trucks into town. That's fine. That's not helpful to polarise the debate and therefore alienate the people who can make the case, but I can't do it yet. And the answer is we're not expecting everybody to do whatever the thing is, but we do need to better enable those who can choose to make those choices. Thanks, Rod. Um, advertorial opportunity for you, Barry. Anything else on transportation and draft advice you want to highlight? Chapter 11. Chapter 11, everybody. Have a look at chapter 11. Uh, there was a question somewhere down. Yeah, please. Thanks very much. 
Hi, uh, Reese Boswell, CrossFit Airport. I, I might have two questions if that's okay. Um, I'm interested in this idea of urban intensification and um, is, it, is there an argument that New Zealand population should be much greater than it is? If we're gonna be um, contributing to the global problem, we are a country blessed with a whole lot of renewable resources. We can feed ourselves 10 times over. Is there an argument that perhaps rather than exporting all that product, we should be um, hosting more people living in New Zealand and thereby affording the investments in infrastructure and, and uh, urban land transport solutions? So that's my first question. Let's have a go. Yes, no, no, I think it's a great to pause there on the first question. Um, more population. Yeah. Would that help, Dave? So I was actually talking to Rod about this just before we started. Um, New Zealand's per capita CO2 emissions have declined since 1990, or since about 2005 or something, something like that. They have come down, but um, our population has grown by about 50% since 1990. And so the result is that as a country, we've got this fairly flat emissions, CO2 emissions. Um, and it's something we don't talk about enough. Uh, and I think what it really needs to be part of is a much broader conversation about sustainable development that New Zealanders want. What, what sort of country do we want to be in 2050? It's a perfectly, migration is a perfectly legitimate thing to discuss. It intersects with the climate issue and a whole bunch of other issues. Um, and I think, unfortunately, we, we fight shy of it for bad reasons as well as good. It's a perfectly legitimate question, perfectly legitimate point. Um, but I don't know right now we have the political or public maturity to have that conversation well, which is a depressing conclusion for an academic to make. So I make a couple of observations about population. One is it would be really good if we were prepared to have the conversation about what a sustainable annual increase in New Zealand's population could look like. Because at the moment, we've got the kind of whipsaw going on of shut the border, open the border, people leave, people come. I can tell you from my time at the Reserve Bank, and it's still alive today, we still do not know whether net migration adds more to supply than it does to demand and therefore is or is not going to contribute to consumer price inflation. The old world assumption was always that net migration led to higher CPI inflation. Turned out in the last big wave of migration, that was not true that migrants added more to supply than they did to demand. And it turns out it wasn't net migration that blew the top off our house prices. It was simply too much money, too low interest rates, not number of people competing in the housing market. So we're sitting here on the eve of what looks like a record, at least quarterly, net migration flow. And our politicians are still saying more must be better, we think, but we don't know. So one of them is the volatility in flows rather than the absolute flows. Second thing is that it's estimated that roughly we emit about three tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent in our daily lives, you, me, and the rest of it. So 5 million people, about 15 million of our 80 million tonnes of CO2 gross per annum. So population is a driver, but not the biggest driver of our emissions. Even if you set aside all of agricultural emissions because of this whole split gas and arguments about what warming and warmer is and all that, we're still at eight tons per capita. China is at just over five tons per capita, everything included. So the issue for New Zealand is industry. So 60% of all New Zealand's medium and low temperature process heat is Fonterra burning coal to make milk powder. So if you don't fix that problem, it doesn't really matter what you do at home. So there are some single points of emission. New Zealand steel, 2 million tonnes of emissions per annum. TY aluminium smelter easing, even only using hydroelectricity, 700,000 tonnes a year of emissions. We have big single points of emissions in New Zealand that if we don't deal with, we will be buying offsets offshore or planting trees to support those industries with their 90% free allocations. And we have to have a conversation about whether that's worth it. Uh, yep, Dave, second bite for you. Yep, just that uh, I'm absolutely not gonna defend Fonterra's boilers. I think you're absolutely right for the picking, but um, but I, as a Southlander, 
I would say TY uh, and to be fair to New Zealand Steel, they're comparatively green producers of their products, right? Uh, not New Zealand Steel. Okay, TY <laughs> is a comparatively green producer. And this comes to the leakage point that if it turns out that it takes more CO2 globally to, um, to produce a, well, those little bars of aluminium than we do at TY, even though it's better for us on the accounting to get rid of it, it's better, it's worse for the world if we do that. Uh, that's, a, I think, a, a more complicated conversation. Yeah, but, but here's the aluminium argument. If TY was turned off, the alternative is probably Iceland with geothermal or more hydro in Canada. It is not burning coal in China. It was right. Rio Tinto are not going to hand over their customer base to the Chinese. So if the leakage argument is taken care of, then great. But the, the can be leakage argument is set of the yeah. The leakage argument is one the commission's thought about and it just says, quote, highly uncertain. It doesn't actually reach through because it depends on how much product substitution you get, whether there are alternative suppliers available. Aluminium is a very cool metal. Oh, it great. is one of the very few metals that you can recover nearly 100% of it at much lower energy input for yep. second and third life use. Never throw your aluminium foil in the landfill, please. And is that a recommendation, Rod, in the, uh, for the draft advice? Um, so that sounds like a ripe conversation about aluminium. There's a group of enthusiastic aluminium conversation here for the tea and coffee after we finish. But the second question, please. Uh, my second question was around uh, carbon capture and talked a bit about uh, land-based forestry. But uh, marine-based forestry, I attended a, a seminar last week hosted by UC, invited a gentleman, Peter Fikowski, from the US. Who had a theory about how how uh, planetary warming might be addressed, engineered in, in some respects to cool the oceans and cool the atmosphere. Uh, are those sorts of ideas being explored? Is that is that mad science or what is? I'll, that? Let, I'll let some of my uh, my more biological friends answer that question, then I'll give you a pitch at the end. But uh... all right, Barry, it's you. I think. Yeah, I, um, I think the the most important thing to say before answering your question is that um, talking about any of that stuff is secondary to abating emissions from fossil fuels. Like once once the stuff comes out of the geosphere and is then into the the above the geosphere cycle, uh, then anything is good after that. But don't lose sight of the forest for the kelp. I guess is the snarky <laughs> answer. <laughs> Because uh, yeah, I mean, it, it would. There, there. It's not a substitute. You would, you know, you should go after your long-lived fossil fuel emissions hard. Okay, super. That's so oh, my, Dave, my, oh, Rod, my quick little factoid is apparently one of the largest organisms ever to live on this planet was an ocean algae that spread from Western Australia to South Africa that existed when carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere were multiples of what they are today. And it sucked in millions of tons of carbon dioxide, died and fell to the ocean floor when it ran out of carbon dioxide. So, you know, the planet does have a way of fixing this, but we may not be around to see it fixed. Super, I've got a, that's great. I always thought it was the Great Barrier Reef, but apparently not then. Um, uh, second prize to the Great Barrier Reef. Um, question in the front. Hi, I work in the um, dreaded Matariki, <laughs> and um, um, I'm not a not a scientist, or um, I'm a criminologist actually. So, um, I was just inquiring for a university. We have a target of getting to, um, you know, 2030, getting to carbon neutral. And what would you say would be the three most important things that this university could do? <laughs> well, as well as you. Um, to, to actually achieve our university goals? Well, that's a great question. And I love the local context. Um, everyone's pointing at everybody else. Um, no, David, please, yeah. you can take that one. Yeah, the, the, um, obviously the first thing is to get rid of the coal boiler because that's the biggest source of emissions and that's underway. Uh, our next biggest um, source of emissions is air travel. And so that's the, 
that's under discussion, but apparently it's a very sensitive discussion. So um, we're, we're also looking at, um, at offsets since we're a reasonably large landowner, we have, we have land available for offsetting. And so uh, the, the um, I guess the long, long term plan, I, I'm certainly not speaking for facilities management, but I know a little bit about their plans and, and um, the long term plan for the, the campus is to have a bunch of buildings like this one, which is heated with ground source, uh, ground source heat pump. And so um, the long term plan would be able to get rid of any kind of combustion boiler because you, um, you've got a very efficient building envelope. Um, that's a, obviously a long-term project. The second building is underway with Rutherford. They're putting in a ground source heat pump for that one, but that's obviously a very long-term and very expensive process. Hope that helps. Great, any follow-ups on that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll play you, right. a, fun, okay, I'll play you a fun follow-up one. And that is universities need to account for their scope three emissions which is all the emissions from your full fee-paying international students. And, and absolving yourself of that responsibility won't last for long as the rest of the world begins to focus on supply chain emissions and, and yours are those full fee-paying international students. Now, the good news is that you roughly earn for New Zealand about $5,000 per tonne of CO2 emitted for those full fee-paying international students. The aluminium smelter earns about $1,500 a tonne for their emissions. Dairy farming earns about $1,200 a tonne for their emissions, and sheep farming earns about $450 a tonne. So if you really did a cap and trade system here and everything was in, you can figure out who's going to outbid who for the right to pollute. Oh, fascinating stats. That runs right off the top of your head. I'm, I'm impressed. Um, any other questions? I can see one at the front, please. Yep. And by the way, we'll take a couple more and then we've got some, some wonderful, uh, I can see some wonderful pastries and food over there and some tea and coffee at the back. People, if you can stay around afterwards and talk to the panelists, but I'll take a question here first. Um, Alison Downard, and I'm just an interested lay person. Um, who, where does the responsibility for education of the public about the carbon emissions, like especially their personal carbon emissions, et cetera, lie? Because I do, I mean, I take up Sarah's point. I mean, I think, a lot of people would do more personally if they knew, you know, what had the biggest impact. And although Rod said what you do at home doesn't matter, I actually disagree because I think if people are doing more at home, they're going to expect more of these other organisations. So I think that, you know, even in the you know overall accounting, yeah. that is a really important factor. And you know, when I used a, a, a calculator to calculate my own carbon footprint. I mean, I was absolutely shocked yeah. and, you know, of interest to see what I should do to try and reduce it. And so I do think education yep. would have a real value, but whose role, whose responsibility is that? Great question. Um, uh, public awareness, education, Rod, I think you're about to refute something, yep. but I'm going to let no, you no, do I that first. Say, I, <laughs> I, I didn't say it didn't matter. I just said, you know, everything matters. Every ton matters. And well well done you for going on the internet, finding one of these calculators and, and giving yourself a dwell and going, yeah, that's really interesting. For most, most of us in our household settings, it is about um, transport and how we heat the spaces we live in. Uh, you don't you don't need magic science or a lot of education to go if you drive a high emitting vehicle and you drive at lots and you fly to Fiji to lie in the sun or Australia to go shopping, you will have high emissions in your household. Um, some households are better placed and better enabled to do anything about their emissions. Some aren't. If you're a tenant in a house, then you have very few choices about how that house is heated and what the environmental footprint of that house is compared to somebody who's a homeowner. And certainly the wealthier you are, the more choices you get about whether you buy EVs or put solar panels on your roof or swap out this type of technology for that. So, so the first thing I would say is knowing your number, which is what we're insisting that farmers do, is actually as important for households as it is for farmers and businesses. And so. So well done on that. Uh, and, and the second thing I would say is nobody in Wellington is funded to do public education on climate. No one. No one feels responsible. Yeah. Um, is because nobody has the mandate of budget? Yeah, I mean, I think, I would say, and I would say this, climate scientists have for decades tried to get this on people's radar, 
And now we're at the point where people have said, well, it hasn't been effective, has it? Because we aren't doing enough, so therefore you've done it badly. But actually it wasn't sort of our core, you know, um, tried working with um, schools. Um, my wife's a climate scientist as well. Uh, we went along to a, to a, a daughter's school and um, that was a fascinating thing. I played a game I designed on um, the commons. You know, the, like um, with little sheep, with little yeah. cotton wool sheep, uh, to show that everybody acting following their interests can lead to disaster. Uh, and um, Sue did something on um, on extreme weather. It's there's so many bits to it that it's really hard to design something simple and clear. Different communities resonate with different lessons, and meeting people where their values are, rather than just telling them where they, that their values are wrong is crucial to successful engagement that doesn't come across as propaganda. That's why the Ministry for the Environment shouldn't do it. Uh, and it's why we should politicize it, uh, depoliticize it as much as we can. You know, um, I get irritated. You know, I'm politically really centrist, but I get frustrated with how much I hear from one end of the spectrum, which presumes that your values all line up there. And how little we hear at the other end of the spectrum or across voters to the right of me. And um, I think the strategies you need to engage people constructively on this are different for those audiences. And we're not doing, apart from this narrow band stuff on the lead, we, we just don't really have good ways of doing it. And what we really need to do is find champions with more traditional values or more libertarian values um, and enable them to bring their people on the journey rather than shout them down and tell them they're wrong about values. Um, I think the public education side is really important. If a business tries to change your behaviour and get you to buy something, it's called advertising. <laughs> If the government or maybe someone on the left tries to get you to change your behaviour to maybe do something good, it's called social engineering. Um, and yet they're exactly the same thing. Um, but the framing has come from elsewhere. There's lots of really good research on how to have those conversations. The stuff by the workshop um, uh, up north has been amazing. But Probably without the, some the, funding... The, the most successful intervention over 30 years has been the anti-smoking stuff. Right? But it took 30 years to go from 70% regular smokers to 12% regular smokers. And it wasn't that most people gave up smoking because they couldn't afford it. But it, the government paid to put signs everywhere. A, a, a government paid 20 million bucks a year or whatever it was. It was millions of dollars every year to run that campaign. And yet when we try and do that don't speed when you drive campaign, real challenge to get New Zealanders not to speed. Um, David, you've been waiting patiently to have a say on this. Over to you. Yeah, just I, I support that education is very important. And I think it doesn't matter at what scale you you think about um, emissions reductions, that for, for at every scale, there's things that are relatively easy to do and things that are progressively more difficult and things that are nearly impossible. And it would be good if education focused on those sort of quick wins and the easy things. It would, that's, that's where we need to focus the education. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks very much, David. Um, I'm going to close it there because it's 3.30 um, and um, that seems like a great time to break for some smaller conversations around a cup of tea and coffee and the bite to eat. Um, I want to give a big thanks to the panellists and a huge thanks to the audience for tuning out on a wet day. So give yourselves and the panel a big applause, round of applause, please. And please join us if you have time um, for a cuppa and a chat at the back. Thanks. We'll be here until four. I try, like I try. You know, there there are effective. There are really hard to dodge arguments about the responsibilities not to do harm from the hearing.
Um, and uh, so I think there's a pool where they can't dodge. Yeah. Yeah. 